This country should be very rich. In fact, it is one of the poorest in the world. Zambia, in southern Africa, one of the biggest copper reserves on earth. All the major powers are scrambling for this metal that is as essential to their economies as oil. There is no war here, no dictatorship, yet Zambia is ruined. And there is worse. Here in Mufulira, the owners of the Mapani mine have built the biggest smelting plant in Africa. It emits a toxic gas, sulfur dioxide. It burns the trachea. It eats away the lungs. Those who inhale it have the taste of rust in their mouths. Once released into the air, particles trigger acid rain. People here call this gas center. It is potentially lethal. Welcome to hell. Welcome to Mufulira, where in two years, locals have gone from servitude to rebellion. Father, you, if you can just foresee from what I've just explained it to you. So my survival at the moment is very risky. Because I'm a father of um, uh, seven children. I'm married. Uh, my family needs to eat. My family, uh, I have, my children needs to go to school, pay school fees. After working in the mines for too long, maybe you may think that, no, there is nothing I can do. But uh, somehow, somewhere, me, I can promise you that uh, God never fails. In heaven, there is no global, there is no economic crunch or something like that. Him is the one who is going to help us. Christopher and Carter settled in Mufalira with his wife and his child 18 years ago. An employee of Mupani, he dug mine shafts with explosives a thousand meters underground. In 2009, the mine made him redundant, along with 3,000 others. There was no strike, no protest. The 40,000 inhabitants of his neighborhood, Kankoyo, are paralyzed by the fear of unemployment. Besides, what can they do when the town is full of security guards employed by the mine? Just a minute, we have a camera. Hmm? 
Kuala Mwananga babela poku ile nga Kuala babela kona ngikatupini yayo ne bala. Babela po junior kanshi. The only hope, the only solution to be resourceful. With these two electric shavers, Christopher must feed his wife and seven children. Three hundred kilometers away, Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. Here lives the man who for years has been trying to figure out where the money from copper goes. Xavier Mwambwa is an economist and director of the Center for Trade Policy and Development, a well-established NGO that monitors the flight of capital from Africa. When I was a child, I wanted to be a NASA scientist and dreamt of going to the moon. But as I grew older, I started getting interested in economic issues and often kept wondering why Zambia was so poor, even though it has so many natural resources. It's very easy to see the link between trade policies and poverty. Historically, Zambia's copper has been exploited and used to develop the European countries at the expense of Zambia's own development. In the late 1980s to the 1990s, the government was persuaded by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to privatize most of the state-owned companies including the mines. This is because Zambia had huge debts and that was one of the conditions to receive help from the multinational institutions. The only state mining company then, the Zambia Consolidated Copper Mine, or ZCCM, was split up and sold to a dozen multinational companies. Zambia gained its independence in 1964. Its leaders immediately nationalized the mines. Thanks to copper, Many schools and hospitals were built. The country became one of the most prosperous in Africa. Within 10 years, its GDP had caught up that of Portugal. But following the oil crisis, the price of copper fell. Zambia's revenues collapsed. The IMF and the World Bank recommended borrowing. At this point, the debt was still serviceable. But then, a second disaster struck. In the early 1980s, the American Federal Reserve suddenly raised its interest rates to attract capital. Europe followed suit, and Zambia's interest repayments tripled overnight. The country was suffocated. Again, it turned to the IMF. But at that time, their policies were ultra-liberal. There would be no more funds without massive privatization. No more public schools or health care for all. Everything was dismantled. As for the mines, they were sold off in 2000. Since then, the price of copper has multiplied by five. Too late for Zambia. Virtually nothing belongs to the country anymore. The agreements signed between the multinationals and the Zambian government were long kept secret. Savior discovered them in 2007. Now, these development agreements were meant to enable the mining companies to have the least social and environmental responsibility, to have also the least possible taxes. For example, the world average for the mineral royalty tax for copper was about 3%, and yet these mining companies were only paying a meager amount of 0.6%. The consequence of this was that the government and the country was being deprived of the much needed money that it could have gotten from these mines. When the Mopani are claiming to say, no, we have cleaned up everything. Mm -hmm. We have cleaned up everything. In fact, in fact. Yes, we So in short, we are saying Mopani has been given something, but it cannot provide anything to us. But it claims it provides. Providing what? what, what, what doing yeah, this is what I'm saying. And what? you yourself uh -huh. what? It doesn't provide. At the same time, you yourself, you are alone. <laughs> Why? Yes, sir. I'm well off. I've got no no. Including you himself. Yes. <laughs> are you working, Mr. Are you working? Are you working? We are not working. <laughs> Who is the problem? <laughs> the problem? I don't know. Since 2000, Mapani has belonged to a company registered under the number 211422 in a hotel in the British Virgin Islands. This is a screen. And behind it, the leader in global commodity trading, 
Swiss firm Glencore. Glencore is the worst of its kind. Founder, American Mark Rich, was sentenced by the US judiciary to 325 years in jail for corruption, tax evasion, and trading with hostile states. He made his name in the 70s by violating the embargo against South Africa. Thanks to him, the apartheid regime kept their access to oil. He even impressed Khomeini's Iran enough for them to entrust him with the organization of huge oil for arms deals. Meanwhile, they held dozens of his countrymen hostage. Tracked down by the FBI, Mark Rich took refuge in Switzerland. There, his offenses did not justify extradition. On the contrary, he was offered citizenship to set up his company in Zug, a charming rural district. Since then, Zug has become the hub of global commodity trading. Mark Rich was granted an amnesty by Bill Clinton a few hours before the end of his term after providing large amounts of funding to the Democrat Party. In France, Glencore is well known. The Swiss giant owned the famous group Metal Europe, for which it organized a fraudulent bankruptcy in 2003. The biggest foundry in Europe was closed down overnight, leaving 823 employees jobless. High levels of lead were subsequently discovered throughout the area. It was in the context of Glencore that Jacques Chirac invented the term patron voyou, rogue employer. Glencore is a smart guy. They understand that if you invest on something, you have to get a return. So evidently, Zambia has been considered as a uh, uh, like good, uh, I mean, object of investment. I would I would put it this way. Dmitry Rychenko is Ukrainian. Glencore sent him along with ten engineers from Kazakhstan to Zambia to familiarize themselves with the extraction techniques developed by Mapani. It's so simple. You sprinkle, you inject acid into the crushed ore. It penetrates the ore. It collects necessary metals, and it means it leaches through the metal and it's being collected in a kind of pond. And after that, you pump it out and utilizing uh, hydrometallurgical processes to extract copper of the leaching solution. This on-site leaching process consists of injecting daily several tons of sulfuric acid directly into the ground under Mufulira. Environmentally lethal, incredibly profitable. It allows for copper to be extracted faster and with less manpower, which explains the 3,000 job cuts in 2009. <laughs> So, <laughs> Because we underground miners, because Water that we get is not pure water. There is at least a proportion of a percentage of acid. These people who are taking water from the mount, mine township, they are in danger. We take the same water from underground. Acid is soluble. It's the same as water. It goes through the rock. It has got no boundary. The groundwater lies just beneath the mine. 
according to Glencore, a pump system prevents the acid from penetrating it. Yet, on January 2, 2008, over 800 people were severely poisoned after drinking tap water. Junior, Christopher's oldest son, was one of them. This area is uh, full with uh, dust mixed with uh, silly, silly slug and um, <coughs> sulfur dioxide exposed in the air. <coughs> Especially it's a powerful sulfur dioxide that we get, than that we used to get in, in, uh, in ZCCM. Glencore claims to capture the sulfur dioxide before it can leave the chimneys. In fact, it is with this recycled dioxide that the company makes the sulfuric acid that it releases into the mine. But Cleopatra, Christopher's oldest daughter, believes that the factory is still emitting sulfur dioxide. <laughs> Since the system was privatized, healthcare is no longer free. The dispensary is bankrupt and the doctors have left. For patients who want treatment for lung disease, the nurses have only one treatment, paracetamol. Hello, Savior. Uh, yeah, it's Anne Sophie from Friend of the Earth Front. The Here in Paris, Anne Sophie Saint-Père works for Friends of the Earth, the biggest environmental network in the world. 
As a specialist in investment policies in the Southern Hemisphere, she's often met Saviour in international forums. Since the intoxication crisis of 2008, they've joined forces. Their ambition? To foster cooperation between NGOs and activists. Their aim? To have Glencore condemned. Uh, what kind of uh, weather should I expect in Paris? Uh, it, it's going to be cold, I'm afraid. <laughs> and um, Brussels is even colder than Paris, so, yeah, so be prepared. To attack Glencore, Saviour must start off with a long tour of Europe. He must meet with numerous informers who have been located by Anne-Sophie. His tour begins in Switzerland, where Glencore has set up its headquarters. Bern, the federal capital. Joseph Lang is quite an unusual MP. Founder of the Vert Alternatif, Alternative Green Party, he spent his life investigating trading companies based in his country. His reputation is such that in 1992, the FBI came looking for him. They needed his help to capture Mark Rich. Switzerland is the biggest destination for copper. Switzerland <laughs> imports more copper from Zambia than any other country. Yes. But if you look at Switzerland, it does not manufacture any copper products. Uh -huh. Glencore today is the first company in Switzerland. It's more important than Nestle, that is the second. And, Mark Rich, uh, and Glencore also is the biggest company of prime material in the world. The, I think Glencore just uses Switzerland to yes. avoid paying tax in Zambia. Yes, yes, yes. And maybe they have a company here where they charge artificial costs mm -hmm. so they can avoid paying tax in Zambia. Mm -hmm. yeah. The main reason that Mark Rich got uh, an accusation of 325 years of prison was exactly that. Mm -hmm. It was with oil. He sold oil uh, from an American company mm -hmm. with another name, but that was his company. He sold it cheap to Switzerland to his own and company. he resold it expensive to another firm in the United States. So he made, he didn't make profits in the United States. Yeah. He made his profits in yeah. Zug, in Switzerland. The canton of Zug lies in the center of Europe and in the heart of Switzerland. A well-maintained, open living space with everything you need and want. Foreign companies in particular appreciate the political stability and the security of our country and the high level of support on economic issues. Zug is a hundred kilometers from Bern. It is now one of the biggest tax havens in the world. Every year a thousand companies set up their headquarters here. The capital gains tax applied to holding companies based in Zug is 0.002%. In other words, a company with a capital of 100,000 euros will be taxed 2 euros. Is the headquarters? <laughs> yeah, that's the headquarters. Okay, okay. There are lots of uh, holding companies mm -hmm. which just have like an office with three people doing just doing some that. paperwork. Yeah. So actually they do some business here. Then it's disappointing the nothing look at, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have the tax much, much mm -hmm. too low. Yeah. And we do attract such companies. It's so we kind of the motor of this kind of uh, getting tax money out of poor countries. Yeah. But that's what we try to do here to stop yeah. this. Ça c'est le dossier Glencore. Okay. So this and these are different companies. Yeah. They are borrowing this money mm. from Barclays. Yeah. Thanks to Stefan Giesler, a green councillor in Zug, Savia discovered by pure chance a confidential report that should never have been there in the files of this documentation centre. It is a request for $8 billion of funding made by Glencore to the financial markets. In it, Glencore vaunts its history and strategy. As the firm is not publicly listed, it is not accountable to any controlling authority. Mark Rich has sold his shares to the managers of the company. 
there are 66 of them, and they have total executive control. Thanks to the talents and crooked ways of its founder, the company has built up an extremely complex network of 80 subsidiaries on five continents. This network allows Glencore to bill anything, anywhere. In other words, it can show a loss in the countries where it extracts raw materials. It can sell these products for a pittance to one of its subsidiaries based in a tax haven, which can then charge importers a high price. Any trace of profits disappears in the tax havens. The result? In 2009, Glencore accumulated over $60 billion of assets, virtually tax-free. Tax havens are neither an accident nor a flaw in our financial system. They are the linchpin. priorities <laughs> So, Nishi, first P1, Gajagut Pamonek and PS, better creepy like a school death. Madame Light Vashmina, much more shan. And to the Vashmia Malait, we start a problem Yakula. Piece together the other parts of the jigsaw, we must go to Luxembourg. Reducing poverty in Africa is the main aim of the European Development Fund. The loans granted by this fund are managed by the European Investment Bank, the EIB, the least known European institution and the most powerful international public lender and borrower. In 2004, Glencore requested a loan to renovate the smelter at Mopani and develop its acid-based extraction technique. Le projet Mopani Copper a été cofinancé par la banque en 2005, c'est la date de signature du contrat de financement, à hauteur de 48 millions d'euros à l'époque. Le but de ce prêt était largement environnemental. Mopani avait réalisé que l'ancienne fonderie de Mofulira n'était plus viable. Elle avait atteint la fin de sa vie normale. Donc, il a fallu réinvestir dans une nouvelle fonderie qui avait pour but d'éliminer ou de réduire les émissions, notamment en poussière et en dioxyde de soufre de cette fonderie. Ça, c'était le but principal pour notre engagement dans ce prêt. Ces matières premières doivent être exploitées et si elles le sont dans une manière euh, intelligente, soigneuse, avec des systèmes mis en place pour que l'État et la population en profitent, eh bien, ces projets euh, miniers peuvent avoir des retombées tant macroéconomiques que régionales absolument essential for the development of this country. How can public funding reserved for the development of the poorest countries have been granted to the most famous rogue employer in the world? At the very time that Glencore was accused by France of fraudulent bankruptcy and massive pollution, the French representative within the EIB ratified the loan to Glencore. The EIB will never admit it. 
It uses these funds to secure Europe's supply in raw materials. If they do not fund Glencore, Zambian copper will go to China or India, an unacceptable threat to the strategic interests of European industry. What we get a point more can drain? One day, you see a News of the long lobbying process that Saviour had put into action eventually reached the ears of Europe's biggest opponent of tax haven, MEP Eva Jolie. She wanted to use Saver's visit to Brussels as an opportunity to ask the EIB for an explanation. And that would already be a huge progress if we shouldn't see any more the situations that Saviour would describe to us. Because today we have all too often seen that these investments were only in the interest of the Europeans and not at all for the development countries. The mining contribution of to GDP has been steadily reducing. So mining in Zambia and elsewhere may not be as important as, as it is. It's definitely a money spinner for the companies. It's definitely bringing in forex, which at the end of the day is ending right back um, in the home countries of the country. When Safia made the contract relating to the mine's privatization, publicly available in 2007, Eva Jolly went to Lusaka to present them to the Zambian parliament. It caused a scandal. For the first time, Zambians discovered where the money from their copper was going. Consacré 48 million d'euros à la mine Mopani. C'est scandaleux parce que euh, nous n'avons aucune garantie que cet investissement va bénéficier aux Zambiens ou aux Zambiens les plus pauvres. Ensuite, Glencore est une société avec un passé trouble, implanté dans le paradis fiscaux. Nous savons qu'il ne paye jamais d'impôts nulle part. Donc, donner des fonds de développement à la mine Mopani, qui a pour actionnaire Glencore, c'est être aveugle. Le souci de renforcer la cohérence, l'efficacité et la visibilité de l'action extérieure de l'Union européenne. La banque se part de toutes les vertus en disant qu'elle a anticipé cette difficulté et que dorénavant, elle a décidé de ne pas investir dans des entreprises qui utilisent des structures dans les paradis fiscaux. Mais quand je leur demande, c'est quoi pour vous un paradis fiscal Il répond avec bonne conscience et qui évidemment anéantit tout effort, mais nous nous servons des listes de l'OCDE. Et comme chacun sait, les listes de l'OCDE sont vides. Les grands paradis fiscaux ne sont pas dessus. Les exportations du pétrole rapportent à peu près 70% de la valeur de l'exportation à la Norvège. En Zambie, la valeur de ce qui rapporte l'industrie minière n'est que de 2%. Je pense que dans quelques décennies, nous allons regarder ça avec les mêmes yeux que, euh, que nous regardions la colonialisation ou l'esclavage. Je pense que c'est vraiment des crimes. To file a case against Glencore, Anne Sophie and Xavier now need lawyers. They find them in Paris, at the headquarters of Sherpa an NGO made up of lawyers specializing in defending peoples of the Southern Hemisphere. It's not the first time they've attacked a project funded by the EIB in Africa. I think if certain conditions are met, we can, push, we can sue the company, legally speaking, in order to make someone be liable for something. You need to prove that he made a failure, that he failed to do something, mm -hmm. a legal obligation, that uh, this failure had impact I mean, if we do consider the pollution, the, the, the 2008 spill, 800 family uh, mm -hmm. injured, we have the failure, but we need to prove the link in between both. Okay. What are the different ways of proving the link? If we want to make the Mopani 
I mean, the Glencore, in fact, company liable. First, victims agreeing to be to set up an NGO. We consider that we are victim and we want to be compensated for the damages we suffered. Mm -hmm. If we don't have this, we can forget the case. Mm -hmm. First. Second, we need absolutely to be able to prove that there is some kind of pollution created by sulfuric acid spills in the water now, then we are not perfect, but it's quite good. Because even though we won't be able to prove that it is coming from the 2008 spills, mm -hmm. we can say quite easily, hey, look, to, we can say to the judge, look, there is no other possibility for such a pollution mm -hmm. than the mine. Back to square one. Anne Sophie must bring back evidence of the pollution and Saviour must assemble the victims. On the ground, Christopher has become their main ally. Not quite an NGO, Green and Justice Organization. Now, I have a lot wako afirisha ko abashinga sosa pamula ndwa fe fitu titikisha ku kunche nde yesu so ba mpa ta panga profit for life na apela ta panga profit ata futa ba ipira tax tuma chu fwe ah ba ta panga profit to am business eh ngaba ngaba diye so wo fwe ka weka so fo ba chitabe na ma books yabo bala be pa ma books yabo ma figures yabo it's possible. It takes time, but it's possible. If you have any process, you have to. About one seven, you can have to Just cleaning it for the hills. It's just going down. Down there is a river somewhere in, uh, down that side. There so is a, a stream. The river in the end. Yes, the stream itself takes the water from the mines, yeah. and then takes the water, pours it into Kafue River, yeah. and that Kafue River, that's where we draw water for drinking. What is in the pipe is a tailings. Tellings are a composition of uh, uh, chemicals, water, and sand. Now, uh, from this end, uh, the stuff will be discharged into the dam. But uh, there is no filtration as the stuff comes from the mines up to this point. If the water, the liquid water contaminant seeps down and leaves a physical thing here, for them that's filtering. Yeah. So the chemical will go right into the stream here? Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> After a uh, copper has been taken out of the solution, that's when they pump it to this side. This is a, uh, the telling dams, telling dam number 11. Mm -hmm. Yes. In 2008, mm -hmm. do you know if it was because of underground seepage of the sulfuric acid because of the leaching method, or it was through one of these? Um, where was the point of contamination with it? Or the point of contamination, we, we were told, although we haven't, uh, uh, we didn't hear the, the exact, thing. you know, you, you, are, you are not given the, the right answers there. Yeah. All we knew was that something happened with the water underground. Uh, underground. For the case to be complete, the test will not be enough. They must now get the principal witnesses of the 2008 accident to talk. At one December. Yes, yes. 20... Okay. Okay. Accordingly, now I'm Okay. But standard, but for the pumps. Yeah, that. Yeah, that. To the signs. 
So the water poisoning was due not to negligence, but to a flaw in the mine security system. The on-site leaching technique is excessively dangerous. The risk of an accident is constant. But the pollution is not just threatening the water table. The Kafui River, a few kilometers from the site, is the country's main water reserve. It irrigates Africa's most beautiful wildlife reserve and flows into the Zambezi. D'une certaine manière, c'est un bien et un malheur pour la Zambie d'avoir d'aussi grandes richesses en cuivre. Ça met la Zambie en position de dépendance très forte d'un seul produit et, et donc aussi de, des variations de prix de ce produit sur le marché mondial. Shaken by Eva Jolie's criticism, the EIB decided to send its two experts to Zambia. En Zambie, par exemple, on a financé ce projet ici, on a financé le redéveloppement de la mine de Kansanchi qui se trouve à quelques dizaines de kilomètres d'ici, près de Solvay ici. Puis on a financé très tôt l'étude de faisabilité pour la mine de cuivre de Lumvana. On a réduit d'environ à 80% la poussière qui était émise par la fonderie et on a réduit dans cette première phase aussi les émissions de dioxyde de soufre d'environ 50%. À mes connaissances, oui, c'est la seule installation qui fait le in situ leaching ici dans la, dans la région. Anne Sophie and Savia are now looking for evidence of airborne pollution. This takes them to the Mufilira Town Hall. You've got the long term emission limits. These ones are set by WHO as to how much is allowed yeah, to be um, poured out into the atmosphere. Dust is supposed to be at 50, but for June itself, they emitted 763 milligrams per normal cubic meter. That would be about 25 times higher. So you can see that they are, they are emitting so much more than is supposed to be emitted into the air. And when you come to like sulfur dioxide, the normal emission limit is 1,000, but they emitted 30,487, uh, so that's 30 times above normal. These figures we're seeing here, mm -hmm. are they taken, like for example, if we see, you know those things we see, the smoke, those yes. the chimneys. Yes, yes, it, yes. So that's the content of that's, these things in that smoke which comes out yes, there. Yes. Okay. So why is there emission from here? Because it's supposed to capture everything? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's something that we've been trying to find out also from them. But of course, you know, some of this information is hidden. It's not really given out, you know, per se. It may damage their own reputation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In July 2009, the level of sulfur dioxide emitted was 72 times the average. More serious still, during the same period the amounts of arsenic emitted were 16 times the average. This arsenic sulfur dioxide mixture is highly carcinogenic. The risk of lung and skin cancer is real. Let us discuss all our issues fruitfully. This we ask it through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 I think we share the same goals as you do to improve environment, to reduce emissions, to make life more worthwhile living here with uh, dust and emissions and water, whatever you have. I hope you have noticed that, or we can we can discuss that whether you have noticed that. You can't move outside when it's emitted. You can't. The eyes get irritated. The nose gets irritated as well. The chest starts getting pain. And we have got uh, uh, babies here. 
I take, uh, I take your point, but yes. uh, I, uh, it's for me hard to understand that the concentration should be higher than it was before. Yeah. So the emissions must be lower than before. Yeah. But it's uh, higher. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, different. Be besides, um, we have got an in-situ plant. Within in situ leaching in -situ plant. Leaching plant yeah. Within the plant. Eh? Yeah which fuses acid. 2008, there was a release of um, acid getting to... Uh, no, I, it, I, know, I know of the incident. This has been planned, studied, well studied, before being introduced. Now, on that particular incident, there was a combination of uh, Cross negligence of uh, some people and uh, let's say the combination of uh, also unlucky circumstances which led that those water was pumped or was coming into the public waterworks. What happens in your country? Sorry, I haven't been to, <laughs> to your country. I've been in Africa for a long time. What happens to your country if such kind of fumes are seen all over the place? Do you have such experiences in your country? No, it would be not allowed to operate this smelter. Yeah. It's not allowed to operate this smelter? No. Nope. Glencore refuses to disclose its figures, refuses all interviews, and denies access to the smelter or the mine. Nothing proves that the pollution has decreased. Yet the twofold increase in copper production since 2005 has inevitably increased the overall mass of toxic waste. Which person do you get information from? Anyone who was affected? That's your first criteria. The passport will be pinned on the, the letter. Right. It's like war. This is basically yeah. war. Yeah. For help us as green and justice right now to our family executives, we need new members. You gotta know that we know to court before any court in any jurisdiction with a view to compensation. <laughs> water that's why you have a problem so it is 1610 which means there was a level of contamination the limit is 1000 We have um, Minua, we should know that we have got 71 copies completed. Thank you for the job, gentlemen. It's not an easy task. Thank you very much. It's not an easy task to get to this. Anne, Sophie and Saviour have spent four months writing reports and conclusions. In the light of the first results, Sherpa have asked the London counterpart to join the case. Hi, I'm Savia. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. We represent victims uh, who have suffered damage at the hands of multinationals who have a link to uh, the UK. Glencore International has a subsidiary in England. So the government um, conducted an audit, financial audit. Mobani, it's of sort of hidden 700 million was off the record. They did not report on it. Can I just ask? Ah, first. 
In the ten years that Joseph Braham had been looking for irrefutable proof of financial manipulations in commodity trading, he'd never seen anything like it. Yeah, the, there is also this element. So some copper is sold under an old contract between Mopany and Glencore. In one instance, only 25% of the, let's say, normal price. It's, and prices seems to be determined by the parent's company, meaning the purchaser. It's... <laughs> you would be in charge of the civil case uh, regarding compensation and indemnization for the, for the spillage in 208. And we would take care of a more uh, media case regarding the tax evasion. Yeah. Okay. One of you, we've certainly got enough evidence here to take back to the UK. Uh, have a very thorough read of all of it, with the intention of taking some form of class action through the UK courts uh, to find some kind of redress for the individuals who've suffered damage. Uh, but as we've said, uh, Glencore's in a very strong position yeah. because they will do everything they can to take advantage of the socio-economic <coughs> level um, mm -hmm. in these areas to claim that there's absolutely no proof that any of this damage happened. Yeah. And so we're in a what we call the David and Goliath yeah. kind of fight. Precisely. Every year, multinational companies wheeling and dealing deprive developing countries of $160 billion in taxes. This explains how so many third world countries have become victims of the processes underpinning globalization. The Mapani case proves that with the help of new business leaders and NGOs from the north, Africa will not remain a silent victim. The struggle will be long, the legal battle discouraging, but it is up to each of us in the north to realize that their victory will determine our future. Economic ruin and environmental disaster. If nothing stops these two connected mechanisms, then what has happened to Zambia will happen to us all. Thank <laughs> you.